Greetings friends and uh, welcome to this introduction to Grounded Theory. We are at the point in this course where we are going to begin to start thinking about how to answer our research question. Uh, in this course we are going to introduce you to two primary ways of collecting and interpreting data, uh, the quantitative and qualitative research methodologies. What we're going to be looking at specifically today is grounded theory, which is a type of qualitative research methodology. Um, quantitative and qualitative research approaches are very similar at the early stages of the research project. Uh, in both instances, you will identify a research problem, um, you'll review the literature, and you'll specify a purpose and establish a research question. After that, um, things begin to diverge quite a bit. We still will collect data, analyze data, interpret data, and then report our findings, but the differences between the two approaches uh, are quite significant. This video deals with grounded theory, which, as I said, is a type of qualitative research methodology. Um, the definition, formal definition, is that it is a systematic qualitative procedure used to generate a theory that explains at a conceptual level an action or an interac interaction about a substantive topic. Another way of saying that is that um, we want to be able to, in shorthand, explain what is going on. That's what it means to generate a theory. Uh, be able to describe what is, um, what is the phenomenon, what it is that we are looking at it from a theoretical perspective. So uh, any number of events, activities, actions, or interactions may constitute the object of our study. And what grounded theory does is to develop a theory that explains what it is that we were looking at. Um, grounded theory was started by uh, two individuals, uh, Strauss and Glasser, uh, who collaborated at first about, um, about how to do um, had to make this approach to qualitative research. They diverged later on in their careers and one became more formal and the other less less formal, less structured. Uh, we are going to go with a the more formalized approach that Strauss recommends. Um, it's easier for individuals at the very beginning of this kind of research to have some kind of a structure to follow, so we are going to follow uh, that pathway. So how do you do grounded theory? What is the actual steps um, involved? Well, uh, this chart may look a bit confusing at first, but um, I think you'll get the gist of how, of how this works. Um, you would start at the very bottom, where you are going to go ahead and collect information. That's the data collection part. Um, it says field notes, interview, scanned materials, uh, documents, and so on. Um, going up the chart, you then would prepare transcripts if you did a interview, and then you read through those transcripts to gain a general sense of things. And then, as we will talk about in a few minutes, you will start coding, uh, coding the document and breaking it up into chunks. And then um, you uh, you um, describe that data in various kinds of ways. Um, and then you start beginning to develop themes. And we call this process an iterative process because you keep going through it over and over again. So if you can imagine the left-hand side being a counterclockwise circle, data collection, prepare, read, code. Um, you go ahead and describe the data and then you go through it again and again and again and again. You may add more interviews, more coding, and so on. And simultaneous to that, you are uh, cycling on the right-hand side, which means you're developing themes, and we'll show you an example of that in just a moment. So we say, again, that this is iterative, and by iterative we mean that we go through the process over and over and over again. You're constantly collecting data until you feel like you've had enough, and then you interpret that data, and you start to develop themes, and you collapse codes together to make themes, and you try different themes, and you keep going through that process over and over again until you've um, Come up with the themes that you think that will describe that will describe the uh, the phenomenon. Another way to look at this, this is the same chart as this, actually, but just described differently. Um, you start looking at the bottom. Uh, you start by looking through many pages of texts, and then you divide those those texts out of the uh, uh, 
uh, the interviews that you have, and then you chunk them, divide them into segments, uh, then you label them with codes, and the codes are your initial way of describing a particular segment or a particular chunk. Uh, then you may combine the codes, and some look like they're very similar. That's what the word redundancy means, and so you collapse those until you, you, you have a certain number of codes that you can collapse into a certain number of themes. And the themes are what are important, because that will then be the shorthand way of describing whatever it is that you've been observing. So the purpose of, uh, of, of coding, the coding process, so let's say that you already co collected the data, you've had the interviews, you've transcribed the interviews, you have this data. So when you code the data, the uh, purpose of that is to make sense of the data. Um, so as we will see in a moment, you divide them into s segments and you, you then uh, label each of those segments. Um, you might actually put, par put brackets around key phrases or ideas or paragraphs. Um, and then in the coding process, there's three choices you have as, into what you would select for a code, and we'll talk about those in just a moment. But there are ways that you can describe what is in a particular segment. And then you group for similarities and redundancies, and then you collapse the codes in, into themes. So basically what I just described to you is another way of describing this, um, this picture here. Start with a lot of data, and you're going to collapse it into, um, into fewer and fewer segments until you have you know, themes that then describe, um, describe the phenomena, the, describe what it is that you are looking for. So um, the, the, the coding process um, is where you, you, you look at the text somewhat holistically. You can see which are, are chunks what what parts of the interview go together and you would identify those um, those segments as some kind of a, a, a part within the whole and when you identify that part within a whole then that's when you give it a name now we have um, three different ways of of, um, of naming that chunk that segment one is the imagery that that chunk suggests to you. If there would be a way of summarizing that, we'll t give you an example in just a moment. Um, this one segment looks like it's talking about aspirations, or this one segment looks like it's talking about fear, or this one segment looks like it's talking about conflict. So there's something in that segment that suggests to you what that segment is about. Um, or you can uh, choose what's called in vivo codes, which means in life or the actual word. So it might be something in that a word or phrase in that segment that you might want to use. Or the literature itself that you've read might have um, a technical word that you might use for that. So we are going to work on this activity. It's called Why I Want to Be a Teacher. And um, what I suggest uh, is that you go through a process very similar to that chart that um, I laid out for you where you code on one side, in this case the left side, and you then develop possible themes on the right. Uh, again, the, 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 the chunk, um, the major category is um, the code that you would, the, the code, in the coding process you would chunk that data and then you would sign a code to it. So in this one paragraph, or a couple, first couple paragraphs in this one interview, um, you can read that and see that the way to chunk that data or describe that data would be to say that this is a, um, I'm going to code this as inspired by a role model. That means a person that this person knew early in life became a role model that inspired them to think about becoming a teacher. So that's the code and the possible themes. Well, m one theme might be the role of role models or another theme might be uh, sources of, of inspiration. As we uh, realize as we go through the uh, process, reading the article or the transcription in this case. Again, the the, the chunk is the highlighted area. Um, one way to describe this particular segment is helping others to realize their dreams. That's what the chunk suggests on the right hand side. The possible theme that could be developed is that you know the desire to to help others. Um, the other theme, or the other chunk, excuse me, is 
is an inventory of, of personal characteristics. I mean, it's one thing to want to be a teacher. The other thing is you have the chops to do it. So the other thing might be the idea of, of wrestling with personal qualifications. Um, the last two segments, uh, one that this work is personally rewarding and, and meaningful. Um, uh, so, so that this um, this could go under the theme of of personal satisfaction. So one one common theme throughout all the essays might be that people choose teaching because it's personally satisfying, and that may be something that shows up in other interviews as well. And then again, under personal satisfaction, people who are achievement oriented and, and imagining a future self. All these are chunks that are part of a theme. Now, in writing about the, the, the theme, you may go back and reference these individual pieces. Uh, this would where be, you would use thick, rich description, and you would go back to these quotes and maybe evidence of of us of either sub-themes or sub-categories within the theme. So you might say the theme is personal satisfaction, and you might talk about how personal satisfaction involves searching for meaningful work, uh, allowing people to to achieve, uh, allowing people to uh, to plan and hope for for a future. So um, once you've done coding and and start working on some initial themes, what you want to do is um, is, is pare all those down to we suggest five to seven. It could be as few as three actually. So. Um, so at the end of the day, when you're writing up your findings, this would be your, your chapter four, um, you would say that as a result of these interviews or these observations or the analysis of these documents, you came to these conclusions about, about um, the major themes that would describe, in this instance, why people would, be, would, become, um, would become a teacher. Uh, people do this a lot of different ways. Uh, there's actually software out that could help you. If you don't have access to software or not technologically inclined, one way to do it would just be sticky notes. And so I just have taken some of the codes that we suggested from this work, and then you can go ahead and um, organize them into themes and put the sticky notes underneath those themes and, and uh, organize things that way. Um, in some instances, people have um, you know, very elaborate processes. They can collect literally hundreds of pieces of paper and spread them out over tabletops and put them on walls and, um, and organize things that way. Uh, it really is helpful, though, maybe almost imperative, that you have some kind of visual way of moving from the codes to the themes that would enable you to, to handle the massive amount of, 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 of data that you um, that you've collected. So, um, so when we report our findings, um, we talk about using a narrative approach, and that you know you can use the dialogue and the language that you heard, um, metaphors, analogies. Uh, you can use multiple perspectives. This person is is an example of this theme, and this person is a similar example. They come about it quite. A little bit differently. So, um, so the idea being that you, you use this data then that you've collected not only to help develop the themes but also to help in the writing process. So as we've talked about in class, this idea of rich, thick description, um, specifically you are you know, pulling quotations from the subjects or phases that are repeated often. Uh, talk about facial expressions, vocal inflections, a person's body language. Um, you can describe the room. You can actually play a little bit of amateur psychologist and examine the motives, possible motives of why somebody might be doing something. Uh, you know, describe their mannerisms and so on. Um, so other ways of, of presenting your data, e even though it's qualitative data, there's oftentimes what looks like a quantitative part to it, but usually that quant is more descriptive. So you can have a table that uh, relates to demographics. Uh, you can uh, create charts that uh, compare and contrast one, one particular uh, perspective um, 
in contrast to another person's perspective. Again, this isn't quantitative research, it's qualitative research being described in a systematic kind of way or presented in a, a simple kind of way. Now, um, we will talk more about this, and I don't mean to confuse you with a um, kind of a quantitative example, but when you present tables, uh, this is the APA formatting for it, and we'll go over it more in class. It's a very simple kind of a presentation. It's basically three lines and then the data in between it. But it's important to, um, to present the data formatted correctly. So at the very end of a qualitative research, you interpret the findings. You just don't leave it at description. You go ahead and interpret. Um, you um, will cycle back to the literature and talk about whether or not this, these findings affirmed what was in the literature or contrasted with it or contradicted it. And then also you will talk about future findings of what, how this might be the foundation for future, for future research. Now we will talk about all these segments uh, a little bit later in the course, but I want to give you an idea of how things, um, things are, are wrapped up. And then the last step in the process is to validate the findings. And that means where you actually check to see if these things be so. Uh, a couple ways of doing that. Uh, one is to um, go back and talk to the individuals that you interviewed and say, this is what I'm coming up with. What do you think? Do you think that this accurately interprets your experience and maybe the experience of others like you? Um, also, you can um, collaborate uh, from different individuals who are outside your particular study, but who might have expertise, and um, look at other ways that um, that data has been collected in the field and described as a way of, of validating the research. And again, we will be talking more about this uh, later in the class. But I wanted to give you the full range of, of, of the process from the very beginning of the data collection process to the writing of it to the, um, to the validation of it at the end. So this uh, concludes a uh, brief introduction to grounded theory. We'll be actually having a lot of opportunity to, um, to go over the various parts of this, but I want to give you the big picture before we went forward.